If you want to know how one location from Stephen King's 1977 novel The Shining made a little cameo in Dr. Sleep, then stick around to the end of this video. This video is brought to you by Privacy.com. Privacy.com lets you buy things online using virtual cards instead of real ones, just like how Danny and Abra faked their location from Rose and her gang in Dr. Sleep. Privacy has rolled out a few new product options, so keep watching to learn more. And as a special treat for my Things You Missed viewers, you'll get $5 to spend on your first purchase. That's free money that you can use to purchase anything online. Go to Privacy.com slash CZsWorld to sign up now. The Shining is my favorite movie of all time, and it came out 39 years ago in May of 1980. The prologue of Dr. Sleep, where Rose and her cult eat the steam of the little girl Violet, takes place in Florida in 1980, which is where Halloran was during the Overlook Hotel's off-season in The Shining. Dick, how you doing? How's the weather down there? I'm not in Florida, Larry. I'm calling from Stapleton Airport. What the hell are you doing down there? Well, I just got in from Miami, and I gotta get up to the Overlook today. Rose and her gang have the ability to sense the biggest shiners in the country and go after them. Is it possible that they came to Florida to get Halloran when they heard him trying to reach Danny at the Overlook Hotel, but missed him and took Violet as a consolation prize? Another homage to the year 1980 is seen during the exterior of Abra's house. The street number is 1980. Dr. Sleep features a musical score that's very similar to that of The Shining, where director Stanley Kubrick used almost all classical music. From the eerie haunting build of Bella Bartok's Music for Strings, Percussion, and Celesta, used when Danny and Jack have the one-on-one -on -one talk in the hotel room, being referenced in the music that we hear early on in the trailer community. to the big, pulsating, tribal drums that echoed through the massive, empty rooms of the Overlook, following Danny to Florida, New Jersey, to the middle of nowhere, and back to Colorado. But The Shining also features a couple of jazz pieces which can be heard when the hotel is showing off events of days past, like Henry Hall's Home, which celebrates Jack Torrance's homecoming to the Golden Ballroom, and Al Bully and Ray Noble's It's All Forgotten Now, which plays while Grady tries to get Jack to remember his role at the Overlook to correct his family and protect the hotel. But I corrected them, sir. And when my wife tried to prevent me from doing my duty, I corrected her. These songs can be heard in Dr. Sleep on the Nomad's radio while they camp out and try to tune into the mind of a shiner with a lot of steam for them to capture next, which reminded me of the line from Abra's mom where she says, I know that head of yours is like a radio. So perhaps Rose and her gang are also picking up on some evil signals being broadcasted from the Overlook. It's during these dream hunting sequences that Dr. Sleep also references a concept seen elsewhere in the writings of Stephen King. Rose invades the mind of Abra while she's asleep and sees a wall covered with filing cabinets, with memories and important facts about her life. King's 2001 novel, Dreamcatcher, gives us a look into the mind of the character Jonesy, who similarly files his memories away to a warehouse, resembling a building in Derry called Tracker Bros Shipping. But Abra's mind in Doctor Sleep is far more prepared to defend itself. Of course, most of the connections to King's writing in this movie are going to be connections to the source material, Doctor Sleep, and its prequel, The Shining. For many movie fans, when they think of the most cursed room at the Overlook, they think of Room 237. But the infamous room number was changed from Room 217 in the novel. This is because of a request made by the hotel where the exteriors were filmed, the Timberline Lodge. The hotel, in perhaps one of the worst marketing blunders of all time, feared that people would be too scared to stay in Room 217. Dr. Sleep makes a little homage to the original room number when Danny Torrance first starts working at the hospice in New Jersey. He sees the cat, Azzy, wander into the room of a dying patient, the first instance of him earning his nickname, Dr. Sleep. And the room number on the door is 217. There's also the fact that Danny, like his father Jack before him, has become an alcoholic. Jack's alcoholism is present in Kubrick's adaptation, but is focused on much more in the novel, where Jack has a catchphrase associated with his drunken beatings of Danny. Come on and take your medicine. Take it like a man. Now, despite this line never appearing in the 1980 film, it does make a comeback at the end of Dr. Sleep, where Danny comes face to face one more time with his father at the bar in the gold room. Uh, they do know that Jack Nicholson is still alive, right? He also pours a glass of Jack Daniels, which is symbolic of the fact that both Jack and Dan resorted to alcoholism at some point. But the Overlook itself would not be the only major connection to Stanley Kubrick's psychological horror masterpiece. And when we return, I'll have even more hidden connections featured in Dr. Sleep.
One scene I found particularly interesting in Doctor Sleep was right after Rose went into Abra's mind and saw the inside of her room. Abra decides to rearrange her furniture and make it look like a different room to protect her privacy. And that got me thinking. Anytime we buy things online, we're opening up our windows for merchants and their data partners to see our personal information without our consent. That's where privacy.com can protect you. They make it super easy to protect your financial life online by generating virtual card numbers that hide your real bank information. So you never have to worry about strangers seeing the info attached to your account. They also let you set limits on each virtual card to protect you from unwanted charges going through. Privacy.com, as always, is totally free to use. You can create up to 12 virtual cards per month, and they've also introduced two new plans. Pro is $10 per month, gives you everything from the free plan, plus 1% cash back on all purchases, 36 cards per month, and even more privacy and security features. If you're using Privacy.com for a team or small business, you'll want the team plan. It's $25 per month and gives you access to everything from the Pro version, plus dedicated account management, 60 cards per month, and transaction limits tailored to your business needs. If you go to my link, privacy.com slash world, you'll get $5 for free to spend on literally whatever you want. So there's no reason not to do it. Just look for the link in the description, privacy.com slash world. The Shining is well known, not only for its genius director, but also its unbelievable performances from Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, Danny Lloyd, and Scatman Crothers. Dr. Sleep chose to recast these characters, even though realistic visual effects now exist, so the characters had to recreate the performances of the actors in The Shining. In the prologue, when Danny is talking to Dick Halloran on the bench, Wendy comes up screaming Danny's name, crying as if she'd been looking for him in a panic, which is a mimic of the penultimate scene of The Shining. There's also a facial expression that fans have dubbed the Kubrick stare, in which a character tilts their chin down while looking up to make them look deviously sinister on camera. During the ambush scene, where Danny and Billy hide out in the woods with rifles to take down the nomads who are coming for Abra, the last one standing is Snakebite Andy, who emerges from the trailer donning the signature Kubrickian look. One of the scenes where Jack can be seen with a creepy expression in The Shining is while he's staring at Wendy and Danny in the miniature hedge maze. So I took it as no coincidence that the town that adult Danny ends up in also has a miniature model version that Danny spends some time helping to build. It is here where he meets Billy, who introduces him to the man that he would interview with for the job at the hospice. And that interview takes place in a room that's identical to the room that Jack interviewed in for the caretaker job at the Overlook. The wall color, layout, window placement, this flag, that pen, the cup, the artwork, and even some of the camera angles used to shoot it are a direct recreation of Jack's interview. For both characters, it represents a point of no return in the story. Other parallels between Jack and Danny exist up and down the plot. I mentioned the fact that they're both alcoholics, and Danny brings this up during one of the AA meetings, saying that he's standing where his father once stood. And that idea comes back when he and Rose face off in the Overlook's Colorado Lounge, and he asks her if she knows where she's standing. The axe fight between Danny and Rose also goes up and down those stairs, being blocked out exactly how the fight between Jack and Wendy went down nearly 40 years prior. But the connections of The Shining do not end there. During the flashback, Wendy and Danny can be seen watching a Bugs Bunny cartoon that illustrates the current state of affairs, and connects to the shirt that Danny wore in his first scene in The Shining. Bugs Bunny is chosen because Bugs' catchphrase is... Nah. What's up, Doc? <laughs> and Danny's nickname in The Shining is Doc which carries over to current times where Danny becomes known at the hospice as Dr. Sleep. Before we move on from Danny, one other thing I noticed was during the end credits. Danny Lloyd, the actor who played Danny Torrance in The Shining, was listed as Spectator. I'm guessing he may have made his cameo at the movie theater or the Little League game. Before Dr. Sleep, he hadn't acted since 1982, but the spooky part is that after he decided to quit acting, he grew up and became a teacher, just as Jack Torrance was in The Shining. <laughs> Unfortunately, one actor who could not have come back to reprise his role was Scatman Crothers, who passed away in 1986. His character, Dick Halloran, has a final conversation with Danny in Dr. Sleep, where Danny describes each of the ghosts of the Overlook's past that he locked away in Halloran's box, the last of which was Horace Derwent, who spat out his signature phrase, Great party, isn't it? as the box locked him away. There are two things you might have missed here. The guy he's referring to seems to be this guy from The Shining. Great party, isn't it? who's credited as injured guest and who I dressed up as for Halloween in 2012. The bald cap didn't really work out, so I ended up just being a younger version of injured guest. Dr. Sleep makes the suggestion that injured guest is actually Horace Derwent, a character from the history of the Overlook Hotel in the novel. Horace was a millionaire, inventor, pilot, film producer, and entrepreneur who bought and renovated the hotel in 1945 and turned the place into an entertainment destination, as well as adding a rogue court in the lawn. 
The Overlook was perhaps his one unsuccessful business venture though, and he sold the property after losing $3 million on it. I guess that the party wasn't so great after all. If you have any other things you noticed in Dr. Sleep, leave them in the comments. I would love to hear what you all picked up on, and don't forget to go to privacy.com slash world and get your free $5. The link will be in the description. And if you love horror, make sure you subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week. Ring that death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.